On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, 60 Minutes examines the state of the Navy. We better call Sal. I'm the aforementioned Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to today's show. So we're going to look at the 60 Minutes episode that was done fairly recently that did in-depth analysis of the United States Navy. Now, this is important to what's going on with shipping because the United States Navy, along with many other navies, ensure freedom of the seas. And without freedom of the seas, we don't get the oceanic supply chain that exists today. A lot of the commerce that moves around the world since the end of World War II has been guaranteed by allied navies around the world, ensuring that ships can freely move and transfer goods. And the question arises, are we heading back into a period of peer-to-peer competition where there are new oceanic challengers on the high seas? And particularly this piece examines how prepared is the U.S. Navy to deal with a threat emerging from China. And of course, we're going to provide our own little kind of viewpoint on that. If you're new to the channel, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, better call Sal. The United States Navy helped secure victory in two world wars and the Cold War. Today, the Navy remains a formidable fighting force, but even officers within the service have questioned its readiness. While the U.S. spent 20 years fighting land wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the Pentagon watched China its greatest geopolitical rival of the 21st century, build the largest navy in the world. China has threatened to use that navy to invade Taiwan, an important American ally. As tensions with China continue to rise, we wanted to know more about the current state of the U.S. Navy and how it's trying to deter China while preparing for the possibility of war. So that's an interesting opening there by Nora O'Donnell. So if you look across the 20th century, the United States Navy was preparing for what's called a peer-to-peer conflict. What world nation are we going to face off with in a potential conflict? Uh, In World War I, we didn't know if we'd fight the British or the Germans, wound up being the Germans. World War II, we were preparing to fight Germany and Japan, and we did. The Cold War, we squared off against the Soviet Union. But in the 1990s, after the end of the Cold War, there was a really a big question. Was this the end of history, to quote Fukuyama? Uh, You know, were we facing a new world order whereby the role of the U.S. Navy without a peer competitor, what do you do with a Navy like that? And so there's a lot of debate about what was happening with it. At the same time, you have September 11th hit. And then for 20 years, you're waging a land war in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, in basically Asia. And what role does a U.S. Navy play with that? And I would argue that the U.S. Navy does a fantastic job documenting its history and its its uh, role in conflicts, but it does a terrible job of doing it during peacetime. And in particular, it's done a terrible job of documenting what it's done in the recent past. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. All right, let's go ahead and get that clock ticking. The story will continue in a moment. Ooh, the Navy's nice always on alert. One third of the Navy is always deployed and operating at all times. The Navy's mustering right now about 300 ships, and there are about 100 ships at sea right now all around the globe. So that statistic is a really interesting one. 300 ships in the Navy, one third forward deployed at any one time. And that is a strategy that the U.S. Navy has taken along with the Department of Defense, which means that if you take that a little bit further... The Atlantic and Pacific, basically the Navy is split between the two, about a 50-50, maybe 60-40 Pacific Atlantic. So that means of those 100 ships, about 50 or 60 are in the Pacific, about 50 or 40 are in the Atlantic. That means that another third of of the 300 are in deep maintenance, meaning they're unavailable, and the other third are either coming back or preparing to deploy, which means that really... All the U.S. Navy can count on for any conflict is about two-thirds of its total number, unless this conflict gets very long and protracted. Add to it that it's split half and half. And that's a big factor. So the U.S. Navy's got to cover a lot of oceans, a lot of territory. And with this idea of forward presence, this forward deployed nature, 
there is not a lot of surge capacity, meaning the U.S. Navy will be fighting with what's forward deployed and some coming from the continental United States, which is the exact opposite, by the way, of the way we did World War I, World War II, where we kept small amount of forces forward deployed, but kept most of the fleet at home. Uh, changed a little bit in World War II, where we decided to push some of the Pacific fleet out into the middle of the Pacific to a place called Pearl Harbor, and that did not work out quite right. Admiral Samuel Paparo commands the U.S. Pacific Fleet, whose 200 ships and 150,000 sailors and civilians make up 60 percent of the entire U.S. Navy. So you don't usually see three aircraft carriers steaming alongside. That was an exercise that was done to catch carriers deploying to the Middle East and across the Pacific. And in truth, that created a huge disruption in the ability to, to rotate carriers. Uh, because of the finite number of aircraft carriers, we have 11, it is very difficult to keep them always forward deployed. You've got to have them rotating back into maintenance and cycles. We met him last month on the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz, deployed near the U.S. territory of Guam, southeast of Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China, or PRC. So the Nimitz is the oldest of the 11 aircraft carriers the United States has. We have 10 Nimitz-class aircraft carriers and one Ford-class aircraft carrier. Ford is the new generation of aircraft carrier. The Nimitz was commissioned in 1975. So you're talking about a ship that's 48 years old. You had to go back like to the age of sail, like HMS Victory, to find ships that are in commission that long. And what's really interesting is that the concept of the aircraft carrier is a very controversial one. Uh, if you go back and you look at how long ships remain the capital type ship, whether it's aircraft carriers, battleships, uh, you know, ships of the line, uh, they stay for a finite period of time. And the Ford class carriers that are being built now, we're planning on those ships to be the premier capital ship into past the 2050s. Uh, Ford will have a life into 2060. And that's a long time. It's a long generation. The question is, will those remain the frontline vessels for, for uh, that period? You've been operating as a naval officer for 40 years. How has operating in the Western Pacific changed? In the early 2000s, the PRC Navy mustered about 37 vessels. Today, they're mustering 350 vessels. This month, China's new foreign minister, Qin Gong, delivered a stern warning to the U.S. He said that if Washington does not change course in its stance towards China, conflict and confrontation is inevitable. This past August, when then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi became the most senior U.S. political figure to visit Taiwan in 25 years, China called it a blatant provocation. So there's a lot of people that argue, sorry, Maui's deciding to come in. Maui has a very firm position here about China and Taiwan. Uh, a lot of people will sit there and say, well, this is hyped up from the United States. You know, China has no ambitions about it. And I, listen, I'm a firm believer that I don't really believe that China wants to invade Taiwan and cause a massive disruption. However, I would have said the same thing about Russia invading Ukraine. Uh, the problem you have in totalitarian kind of dictatorships, which is basically what China has become, is that you can never figure out what the dear leader wants to do. And so you have to kind of plan for that. But China's rhetoric is pretty bad. And when you read through their rhetoric and what they say and what they read, they make very overt statements regarding the U.S. Navy and the issue of Taiwan. The People's Liberation Army fired ballistic missiles into the sea around Taiwan and encircled the island with aircraft and warships. There's been multiple Taiwan crises. I think we're up to four now. And since the separation of Taiwan from mainland China back in 1949. So are Chinese warships now operating closer to Taiwan after Nancy Pelosi's visit? Yes. The best guess anyone has about China's ultimate intentions for Taiwan comes from the CIA. According to its intelligence assessment, China's President Xi Jinping has ordered the People's Liberation Army to be prepared to take back the island by force by 2027. And if China invades Taiwan, what will the U.S. Navy do? It's a decision of the President of the United States and a decision of the Congress. It's our duty to be ready for that. But the bulk 
of the United States Navy will be deployed rapidly to the Western Pacific to come to the aid of Taiwan if the order comes to aid Taiwan in thwarting that invasion. So that issue there is a really interesting one. So a pre predecessor to Admiral Papero, uh, Admiral Davidson, identified 2027 as really that area where we have the most vulnerability in terms of decommissioning ships and the phase out of weapon systems, uh, what becomes known as the Davidson window. And we're right in that period right now where the U.S. Navy is on a decline. It's not scheduled to come back up during that period of time. And this deployment he's talking about is a very interesting one. This map kind of shows you that deployment he's talking about where we would have to surge assets into the Western Pacific to do that. And there's a lot of issues associated with this. Again, 11 aircraft carriers we have in the fleet. The carriers are the primary strike weapon of the U.S. Navy. Five on each coast, one in a deep maintenance at Newport News having its reactor record. And so five on each coast, you have maybe one forward deployed of those five, one in backup. So you have four aircraft carriers ready to go, two in the Pacific, two coming out of the Atlantic. And now you have to surge them across. Uh, we have not kept an aircraft carrier in the Indian Ocean, for example, for a while now because of Russia, Ukraine. That carrier has been in the Med, it's been in the Europe area. And so one of the big problems is how fast can you get an aircraft carrier in the Pacific? You'll have one one maybe stationed in Japan, the Ronald Reagan, you'll surge one out of the Pacific, either Hawaii or California. But then the two East Coast aircraft carriers have to go a very circuitous route. They can't come through the Panama Canal. They're too big. They're literally too big to fit through the Panama Canal. Even with the new lane of the Panama Canal, they're too big. You think the United States would have talked to Panama about that or at least designed the Ford to be able to get through that new lock, but it doesn't, which means it either has to go all the way around South America, it either has to go all the way around Africa or through the Suez Canal here and come through, which means Egypt could potentially block it come out the Bab el Mandab here at the very southern end of the Red Sea, but Djibouti is right there. This is the one place where China has a naval base. So the idea that you're going to be able to deploy large numbers of naval forces quickly is a bit of an issue, I would say. You're going to have to fight a war with the forces that are pretty close at hand when it comes to that. And, and again, that means it's one of the reasons why the Navy keeps this forward defense posture. Is the U.S. Navy ready? We're ready, yes. Uh, I'll never admit to being ready enough. Yes. President fact, Biden has declared four times, including on 60 Minutes, that the U.S. military would defend Taiwan. And that is significant right there because there is no real treaty that says we would go in and defend Taiwan. There's agreements to support them. There's agreements to aid them. But there is not a NATO style treaty that says if China attacks Taiwan, the U.S. will immediately react. It is dependent on politics. I should also mention that President Trump, when he became president, the first phone call he made as president to a foreign leader was to the president of Taiwan which is a democracy and the world's leading producer of advanced microchips. To reach the USS Nimitz, we first traveled to America's westernmost territory, the island of Guam, in the middle of the Pacific. Guam was taken by Imperial Japan two days after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. U.S. Marines recaptured it two and a half years later, and the island, about the size of Chicago, became an indispensable strategic foothold in the Western Pacific, as it remains today. So Guam obviously plays an inordinate role here in this, along with Hawaii, I would mention. And a couple of things that were not mentioned at all in this video, but probably should. Number one, defenses for Guam. Uh, there has been a reluctance for some reason to put in defense, point defense weapons, air defense weapons, and really start to fortify Guam into a bastion for the United States. Uh, this is the ironic thing that the reason that Guam was captured within two days during the war with Japan was because under a treaty, uh, Guam wasn't allowed to be fortified. This was the Nine Power Treaty or the Pacific Treaty that was signed. And so Guam was seized almost immediately. At the same time, over at Hawaii, we want to talk about the logistics here for a second. The Red Hill facility, 
facility, these are the fuel depots that was built into Hawaii after the attack on Pearl Harbor because the fear was the fuel tanks were exposed and, and could be struck and the U.S. would be crippled if their fuel supply was destroyed in Hawaii. They built these underground fuel facilities, but now they've been leaching into the water and now the Navy has shut down Red Hill or shutting down Red Hill. And that means if you have to get fuel for that aircraft carrier, even though it's nuclear powered, it's planes aren't nuclear powered and its escorts aren't nuclear powered. That fuel is going to have to come all the way across the Pacific. They don't really discuss logistics at all in this video. From Guam, we boarded a Navy C-2 Greyhound. The Cold War era transport plane takes people and supplies back and forth from land to the carrier. The cod. It was a short flight to the ship and an even shorter landing. Controlled crash. First cod landing? Yes. Oh, very nice. Certain operations. Before Admiral Paparo rose to lead the Pacific Fleet, he flew jets and graduated from the school known as Top Gun. When you talk about ships, what's the most powerful in the U.S. Navy? It's an aircraft carrier, and its air wing is capable of 150 strike or air-to-air -air sorties per day, with uh, at its surge levels the ability to deliver 900 precision guided munitions every day and reloadable every night. Well, I, I'm gonna question the numbers there just a little bit because that tempo of operation is gonna burn through your air wing and more importantly, it's gonna burn through your ammunition, which means you have got to have the logistics set up to resupply them. I also will question the Admiral on one thing. The most powerful vessel in the U.S. Navy is not an aircraft carrier. It is a boomer submarine. It is an SSBN, a ballistic missile submarine that has 24 Trident missiles, each of them with a roughly three megaton warhead. But nobody ever wants to use those because it's an end of the world type weapon. So even though China now has the largest Navy in the world, they don't have anything like this in terms of aircraft carriers. They do not, but they're working towards it. And they have, they have two operational aircraft carriers right now. That's China's two diesel-fueled carriers to the U.S.'s 11 nuclear-powered ones that can carry a total of about 1,000 attack aircraft, more than the navies of every other nation on Earth combined. Okay, I'm going to take a step back for a second here. So... China has actually three aircraft carriers. They're working on the third one right now. The first one was really a pure they got from uh, Ukraine and Russia and just trying it out. And a lot of people are poo-pooing the Chinese aircraft carriers. Let me be clear. The most recent aircraft carrier they built is about 80,000 tons. So it's about the size of a U.S. conventional aircraft carrier, a Kitty Hawk class that we decommissioned. So it's not a, a poor aircraft carrier at all. And China is very rapidly advancing in their ability to handle aircraft off those vessels. The other thing is the number there on aircraft. She talked about the idea that it's about a thousand aircraft spread across 1,100 aircraft, across 11 aircraft carriers, excuse me. Again, one aircraft carrier is always out of commission because of nuclear refueling. That leaves you 10. She's saying that there's a hundred aircraft in an air wing. And the problem is the U.S. air wing isn't what it used to be. So if you really want to read up on this, this study from the CSBA, the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, came out in 2018. Uh, Brian Clark and a host of other people wrote it. Regaining the high ground at sea, transforming the U.S. Navy carrier air wing for great power competition. This is an air wing of an aircraft carrier. Uh, you're talking about 67 aircraft, not 100, 67 aircraft. 36 F-A-18s, uh, typically the Super Hornets, the E's or the F's about 10 F-35 uh, Charlies, and about five E-2Ds. These are the Hawkeyes. These are the radar aircraft. Five E-18 Growlers. These are electronic warfare aircraft that are going to be phased out here soon. And then about 11 helicopters on board. So the amount of strike aircraft you have is actually not as much as most people think. This chart is perhaps the most concerning in the entire study 
because it talks about the payload of the of the aircraft, which has increased over time, which is what you kind of expect since World War II. We've seen maximum payload really increase. The problem is the range has actually decreased since the Cold War. If you go back here and you look at you know 1945 range of aircraft and, and what they have, and then all of a sudden you see them extend, extend, and all the way out here to about the period late in the Cold War, you're really at the the max range you have. But then all of a sudden they phase out our attack aircraft, particularly the A6 intruders. And then they don't build a replacement for it. And literally all the strike aircraft we have now, the F-18s and the F-35s, are fighters equipped to carry bombs. And what you saw is a reduction in actually the distance they can fly, which means that the range they have to strike is much less than before, meaning they're gonna to have to get within the uh, Chinese missile envelope. I'll tell you this, we are here to stay, right? In the South China Sea and in this part of the world. So hats off to the U.S. Navy for having younger officers interviewed for this. They didn't just have the admirals do it. They actually had a younger officer, which I think is, is great for them. And I think that's the message that we really want to convey to not only China, but the entire world. We will sail wherever international law allows. Lieutenant Commander David Ash flies an F-A-18. Do you get briefed on China's growing military threat? and the progress that their Navy is making. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely we do. And they are making great progress in a lot of key areas. Uh, the Chinese. The Chinese are, from a military standpoint. This video from Weapons Systems Officer Lieutenant Commander Matthew Carlton shows his F-A-18 strafing ground targets with a machine gun on a U.S. weapons range near Guam. Can we just take a moment here and compliment the lieutenant commander for the excellent deployment mustache there? I, I, if you're unaware, one of the keys that the Navy loves to do when they go on a deployment is grow their deployment mustache. And that, sir, is a great deployment mustache. Kudos to you. The pilots on the Nimitz also conduct air-to-air -air combat or dogfighting drills daily. How aggressive has China become in the air? Aggressive. And uh, just some examples include unsafe, unprofessional intercepts where they move within single digits of feet of other aircraft, flashing the weapons that they have on board to the air crew of the other aircraft, operating in international airspace, maneuvering their aircraft in such a way that denies the, the ability to turn in one direction. If they're safe and professional, then there's no problem. Everybody has the right to fly and sail wherever international law dictates. But the China Let's go back for a second. Let's remember prior to September 11, 2001, an incident involving a Chinese jet and a U.S. Navy EP-3 uh, Ares reconnaissance aircraft where they bumped wings and you had a basically a situation where the plane had to go down. And that was a situation that really heightened tension. And this is pre-2000, uh, September 11th, 2001. And so what we're seeing is an increase in these kind of appearances. Remember, we just had a moment where the Russians brought down or attempted to bring down a U.S. surveillance drone over the Black Sea by dumping fuel on it. And then the Su-27 hit the drone, damaged the propeller, and the U.S. was forced to crash land the drone. These are pushing that. They are pushing it. China's increasingly aggressive moves in the Western Pacific, encroaching on territory, illegal fishing, and building bases in the middle of the South China Sea have pushed nations like Japan and the Philippines to forge closer military ties to the U.S. And this past week, Britain, the U.S., and Australia signed a landmark deal to jointly develop nuclear-powered attack submarines to patrol the Pacific. And that caused an immediate reaction by China, who said that this was being aggressive. The fact that Australia, U.S. and uh, the U.K. are doing this. So, again, what you're seeing is regional tensions beginning to escalate. Japan, for example, doubled, doubled 
its defense budget to increase its maritime self-defense force. You're seeing Korea go along those lines. You're seeing uh, the Philippines doing this. And again, I, I think one of the things we keep thinking about is the fact that the U.S. and China may get into a conflict together. I'm more concerned about an East Asian regional conflict between China and one of the smaller nations in the area, smaller than the United States, uh, getting involved in a conflict because that has the potential to kind of suck everybody into a larger conflict. This is how China and Taiwan appear on most maps. This is how the Chinese Communist Party sees the Western Pacific. Okay, I want to be clear, they stole this from me. I use this all the time. I just did a presentation last year in Canada where I did this, and this actually comes from a historian I know that, that did this in his book, uh, uh, Clark Reynolds in his book uh, on uh, navies, uh, where he loved to turn everything around on its side. And this representation, I think, is so important because people don't appreciate how China views the world. Including the South and East China Seas from Beijing. Taiwan is the fulcrum in what China's leaders call the first island chain. If you take a look at that and think about that for a second, the Tsushima Straits right here between South Korea and Japan, even if you get through there, you got to go through either the Japanese Straits between two of the main home islands or between uh, uh, Russia and Japan. And then you have the Japanese islands here with Okinawa sandwiched right here. You have Taiwan. You have the Philippines down here. You have Malaysia. You have Vietnam. You have the South China Sea. This is where the islands they're fortifying. And even further off this map, down here towards the right, you would have Singapore, Indonesia. And then even when you come out of the top of the Malacca Straits, you have the Adaman Islands, which are controlled by India. Man, if you were China, you can't get outside of your ports without having to cross through territorial waters of some other country. We don't have that. When you sail out of LA and Long Beach, there's no other country there. Same thing out of Chesapeake Bay, New York, New Jersey, Savannah, Houston. You don't have this problem. China does. And understand China's view of the world is much different than we have. When we do the freedom of navigation operations, when we sail ships through the Taiwan Strait, we sit there and say, that's freedom of navigation. China sees that as their own waters. And this isn't much different than the Chinese view of British ships from the East India Company coming in and blowing up Chinese junks during the Opium War or U.S. Navy gunboats sailing up and down the Yangtze River. I'm not condoning the Chinese view, but that is the Chinese view. And I think we need to understand that to really appreciate way, the way China reacts at times. A constellation of U.S. allies that stretches across its entire coast. Control of Taiwan is the strategic key to unlocking direct access to the Pacific and the sea lanes where about 50% of the world's commerce gets transported. Those sea lanes are open. Let me be clear. I, that, that's the thing I, I disagree right here with. Those sea lanes are open. The U.S. and its allies guarantee that. China doesn't have to worry about that, but they are concerned about it for a couple of reasons. So if you're China, the thing that sits in your mind, again, Chinese history is ingrained into them. And Chinese know their history really well. And one of the things you have to do is go back to World War II. And when I say World War II, I'm not talking about the U.S. getting bombed uh, on December 7th. I'm going back to 1931 when Japan invades Manchuria and 1937 when Japan invades the rest of China. And the plan that China, that Japan executed against China was a strangling plan. They basically set out to seize all the ports and cut it off from the outside world. It could do that, but except for a few key areas, Shanghai was one because of the international settlement. So they just grabbed the area around Shanghai. Hong Kong was another. Northern, what was then Indochina, today Vietnam, and then the Burma Road coming through Myanmar, which was British at the time. And when you look at what Japan did with China, it systematically tried to cut China off from the outside world. And even after the Japan does attack 
the United States, Great Britain, France, uh, Canada, uh, Australia, and the Netherlands. That was their plan. They they cut, again, northern China when they occupied French Indochina. They cut the Burma Road. They seized Hong Kong. And basically, China was cut off except for the, uh, the hump, which was flying supplies over the mountains. But even that was so small of an amount. It was used only really for U.S. Air Forces in operation. China never wants that to happen again. Then if you look at what happens to Japan in World War II, it's seizing the, the Dutch East Indies, what is modern day Malaysia and Indonesia. It's worried about the Philippines that the U.S. holds is going to be able to cut them off. So they seize the Philippines, hence the attack on Pearl Harbor. And then what does the Americans and the allies do to Japan? They cut them off from their supplies. They starve them. They strangle them. They mine their waters. They interdict them. That's what caused Japan to surrender. Yeah, the atomic bombs had a role in it, but it was the strangulation of Japan. It was the fear of the Soviet invasion. It was the systematic bombing campaign. It was the atomic bombs. It was all of that contributed to that. And China knows that. And so China has this fear that the same thing that happened to Japan could potentially happen to them. Again, what triggers Japan on their moves? Cutting off oil supplies, embargoing all the things that Japan needed for its economy. That's in the back of their mind all the time. China has accused the United States of trying to contain them. What do you say to China? I would say, uh, do you need to be contained? No, but that's the fear they have. Are you expanding? Are you an expansionist power? To a very great extent, the United States was the champion for China's rise. And in no way are we seeking to contain China. That is true. I would argue that the U.S. Navy and the job it did post-World War II, ensuring the freedom of the seas, was the best benefit for China. No country probably has benefited more from freedom of the seas than China. We should be thinking about that. Would China really want to jeopardize that? But we are seeking for them to play by the rules. China's Navy, a branch of the People's Liberation Army, is now the world's largest. China is also using its 9,000-mile coastline to rewrite the rules of fighting at sea, as these images from Chinese state media show. Its military has invested heavily in long-range, precision-guided weapons, like the DF-21 and DF-26, that can be used to target ships. <laughs> China's People's Liberation Army Rocket Force calls them carrier killers and has practiced shooting them at mock-ups of American ships in the desert that look a lot like the Nimitz. Since the United States has been operating in the Western Pacific, China's backyard, they've been developing missiles to attack our assets, haven't they? Specific missiles. Absolutely, yes. First, I'll say the United States is also a Western Pacific nation. So Guam. it's not it's not China's backyard. It's you know, it is a free and open Indo-Pacific that encompasses numerous partners and treaty allies. And yes, we have seen them greatly enhance their power projection capability. How much do you worry about the PLA rocket force? I worry, you know, I'd be a fool to not worry about. It. Of course I worry about the PLA rocket force. So worrying about the rocket force really does probably sit on everyone's mind. No one is sure exactly the accuracy of these missiles, how sophisticated they are. You can go ahead and blow up an outline of an aircraft carrier in the middle of the western desert of China, but can you do it at sea? That's the big question. This uh, map comes from that same study by CSBA, and one of the things you can see on here is the combat radius of the DF-21, those carrier killer missiles. And you can see basically where they sit in here. You can see the longer range bombers and aircraft that they have, how far out they can reach. And obviously the Western Pacific falls within that umbrella. Also notice that Korea, Japan, the Philippines, Vietnam, Taiwan, obviously, are all within that umbrella. And that's the big fear that a lot of people have. Uh, fixed uh, bases in Korea and Japan, fixed uh, things like shipyards, uh, ship repair, ship construction, fuel depots, all of those are at risk should China decide to take action. Of course, I work 
every single day to develop the tactics and the techniques and the procedures to counter it and to continue to develop the systems that can also defend uh, against them. About how far are we from mainland China? 1,500 nautical miles. They can hit us. Yes, they can. If they've got the targeting in place, they could hit this aircraft carrier. If I don't want to be hit, there's something I can do about it. Well, you can move the aircraft carrier, but he also has ballistic missile defense systems mounted on some of his vessels. And that's a key aspect that would be utilized by the aircraft carrier Nimitz and its battle group should the Chinese decide to strike at them. But again, we just don't know a lot about the accuracy of these missiles going out over the ocean and the be able to adapt. Again, you all you need is open source intelligence these days. Satellites can detect aircraft carriers just on the open ocean. We see that with tracking of vessels all the time. U.S. Navy planners aren't just plotting how to evade China's rocket force, but also how they could effectively fight back. From the vicinity of Guam, none of the aircraft on this ship has the range to approach Taiwan without refueling in the air. Ships like the U.S. destroyer Wayne E. Meyer, part of the Nimitz strike group, would need to sail much closer towards China to fire their missiles at any force invading Taiwan. One naval scholar we spoke to likened it to a boxing match in which a fighter, in this case China, has much longer arms than their potential opponent, the U.S. And that, again, goes back to those carrier strike packages and the ranges and developments. Uh, we kind of fell behind in some missile technology. We lost the range and capabilities on our air wings, and now we're trying to catch up. I'll give you a lot of examples where a shorter fighter was able to prevail over a long armed fighter by being on their toes, by maneuvering. And we can also stick and move uh, while we're developing those, those longer range weapons. One of the things not talked about in this video, what's really important is we don't fight alone. The Navy will not be fighting against China by itself. The Air Force will have aircraft bombers, B-52s, B-2s, B-1s, loaded down with missiles and bombs that can be used and are quick mobile platforms that can be used to strike out. The Army and the Marines are talking about deploying forces along the first island chain to set up missile bases and, and defense areas, the Marine littoral regiments. So there's a lot of elements here. This piece just focused solely on the Navy, but there's a lot of pieces within the joint fighting capability. And then if you can get Japan, Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam involved, then you start talking about combined. There is another area of modern naval warfare where the U.S. had a head start and retains a deep advantage over China. I just noticed out of the corner of my eye. This, this is, is a 688 class, a Los Angeles class attack submarine. This is the most capable submarine on the planet. So I can't tell you the number of reporters, naval reporters, who saw this and were just, I'm going to say, pure envious about this because 60 minutes can get them to surface a submarine alongside an aircraft carrier for B-roll. Uh, only 60 minutes can do that. Uh, everybody else can't. I, I will say something real quick. The 688 that they're showing right there, that's not the newest submarine in the U.S. fleet. The Virginias are. But the last of those submarines were built in 1989. So this, this is an older platform here. We have about 60 submarines in the fleet. And again, start doing the math, uh, divided between Atlantic and Pacific, about one third forward at any time. Uh, not all the submarines can be sent forward to the area of the Western Pacific. So you're talking about maybe six to eight submarines available at any one time. What's really interesting about this is the U.S. Navy really doesn't talk about deploying nuclear submarines with carrier strike groups. And this is obviously a clear indication that they do. You know, with the exception of the Virginia class, our newer class of submarines. The exact number is classified, but our best estimate is that there are about a dozen nuclear-powered fast attack submarines patrolling the Pacific at any time. I think it's a little less than that, but I think there's maybe about a dozen available. They are difficult to detect and track, something China is trying to solve. How much more advanced is U.S. submarine technology than Chinese capability? A generation. Generation. And uh, by generation, I think 10 or 20 years. But broadly, I don't really talk in depth about submarine capabilities. 
So I had a friend who <laughs> I, I joked about this on Twitter where I said, you know, maybe that's a Chinese submarine. And he uh, he was a uh, P3 S3 uh, uh, flight officer. And he said, well, if that was a Chinese sub, you would have to have them to, to stop moving so you can film this interview because it'd be so loud. So Chinese submarines are notoriously loud, notoriously noisy. But what gets me about this interview is that he's going to sit there and say that they're about a generation behind, about 10, 20 years behind. Our submarines 10, 20 years ago were pretty quiet. So I'm wondering how fast the Chinese are adapting their submarines to new technology. This is the big fear that a Chinese-Russia alliance can do, is that Russia can sell some quieting techniques to China about their submarines. Because if Chinese submarines become holes in the water, that's a big problem out in the Western Pacific. It's the silent service. Since Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, China's military leaders have themselves been mostly silent and ignored efforts by the U.S. military to keep the lines of communication open, even when a Chinese spy balloon breached American airspace and was shot down by the U.S. If the U.S. and Chinese militaries can't communicate over a Chinese spy balloon, then what's going to happen when there's a real crisis in the South China Sea or with Taiwan? We'll hope that they'll answer the phone. OK, that's not encouraging. Else? We'll do our very best assessment based on the things that they say in open source and based on their behavior to divine their intentions and we'll act accordingly. Doesn't that make the situation even more dangerous if U.S. and Chinese militaries are not talking? Yes. Several sources within the Pentagon tell 60 Minutes that if China invaded Taiwan, it could very well kick off in outer space. Which would make the most sense. One of the things we've been seeing here is a lot of technology which is geared to global positioning systems, communications, and the fact that the U.S. is so dependent on those, and everyone is, it, that could be the place where they strike. And, and again, space would be one of the first places that you would see this fighting take place. With both sides targeting the other's satellites that enable precision-guided weaponry. Cyber attacks on American cities and the sabotage of ports on the west coast of the U.S. mainland could follow. So just did a video not too long ago about Chinese cranes in the United States. This is one of those fears, is that a cyber attack on the ZPMC cranes, these are the cranes built in China that are in U.S. ports, about 70 80 percent in U.S. ports, uh, and they could basically hamstring. Uh, be turned off, they could be damaged, who knows what. But all of a sudden, this could shut down trade in the United States. One recent non-classified war game had the U.S. prevailing but losing 20 ships, including two carriers. Does that sound about right? That is a plausible outcome. Okay, that is terrifying. Can I be clear about that? Two aircraft carriers? We could lose. Again, go back to that scenario at the very beginning. That's the two forward deployed carriers that are there in the Pacific, probably, because, again, there's only five on the West Coast. And again, you're not going to get one of them. And, the, you know, the other two are going to be in and out of a maintenance cycle and maybe two deployed. Uh, and then you're waiting for the Atlantic ones to come in. Uh, not to mention the fact there are 5000 people on an aircraft carrier. And then you're talking about 18 other ships. Man, that is a lot of loss right there. Understand, the early part of World War II, we had six aircraft carriers we were operating, six first-line aircraft carriers we were operating, basically. And we lost four of them, you know, fairly early in the war, Lexington, Yorktown, Hornet, and Wasp, leaving you with Enterprise and Saratoga and Ranger on the west, on the East Coast. Uh, but that, that was a big attrition right there. I mean, it was a huge attrition. Uh, but we also had 13 Essex-class carriers on the ways coming and then more after that. And so we had a big, huge shipbuilding base that replaced those. We don't have that shipbuilding ba base to do that. The Ford is not in commission yet, not in commission yet. And, and it was launched in 2009. And so we don't see, you know, the ability to replace those carriers at any rate. I can imagine a more pessimistic outcome and I can imagine a more optimistic outcome. We should be clear eyed about the costs that we're potentially incurring 
Wow. Can I just hats off to Admiral Paparo? He was straightforward and that man did not pull any punches in this interview at all. There are about 5,000 Americans on board the Nimitz. The ship is nearly half a century old. Yes, it is. Given the Navy's current needs in the Pacific and because there's fuel left in its nuclear reactors, the carrier's life at sea is going to be extended. Well, it's also because the Ford carriers are so late coming out. Is it your hope that the power of the U.S. Navy, the force posture of the U.S. Navy, will deter a Chinese invasion of Taiwan? It's not my hope, it's my duty, in conjunction with allies and partners, to deliver intolerable costs to anybody that would upend the order in violation of the nation's security or in violation of the nation's interests. The saying, which is, see Pachem Parabellum, which is, if you want peace, prepare for war. As China's President Xi prepares for a state visit in Russia tomorrow to strengthen that alliance, we look at critical questions about the state of the U.S. Navy and its readiness when we come back. So that first half, I thought, really hit it out of the park. I thought it was really well done. I think they covered a lot of bases there. Obviously, you can't go in depth like I just did with you. That's the reason for this video to kind of build on that a little more. But they definitely hit on some key points. Uh, again, I think the issue of the age of the U.S. Navy is concerning. Uh, the Chinese Navy is building at a very fast rate. Uh, and they talk about that in the second half, which we're going to look at in the next video. Uh, but again, one of the things we're looking at is, is issues about how do we operate in the Western Pacific with a China that is growing in power, has the ability to range out quite a long distance, and we're doing it with fairly older platforms that don't have the range and capabilities that previous platforms had. And again, we, we kind of lost period there after the end of the Cold War because we really didn't see China emerging. Again, go back to what Admiral Paparo said 20 years ago, China had 30 something ships. Now they're over 300 ships. Uh, who would have seen a tenfold increase in the size of the Chinese Navy and the growth of the Chinese economy out there? So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, hey, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up, and we'll be following up with the second part of this video in the next day or so. Until then, this is Sal signing off.